welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wiltshire, host, and our guest is Priya Natarajan, a professor in the departments of astronomy and physics at Yale University. Professor Natarajan is a theoretical astrophysicist interested in cosmology, gravitational lensing, and black hole physics. Her research involves mapping the detailed distribution of dark matter in the universe, exploiting the bending of light en route to us from distant galaxies. However, we are not here today to talk to Professor Natarajan about astronomy and physics. We are going to talk with her about gender parity issues. Professor Natarajan is the current chair of the Women Faculty Forum at Yale, and she recently co-organized, along with Judith Resnick and Reva Siegel at the Yale Law School, the very first Gruber Conference titled Parity as Practice, The Politics of Equality. Welcome, Professor Natarajan. Thank you very much. What led you to organize this conference? Why do you think it is important to have done it? Well, first of all, uh, it was a unique opportunity to kick off sort of the Gruber Fellowship Program moving to Yale. Mm -hmm. And there seemed to be a real confluence with the goals that the WFF exemplifies um, in terms of uh, exchange of women scholars on issues pertinent to women, scholarship by women on women, and also trying to understand the role of gender, the lens of gender, and, its, and the role that it plays in society in many different domains. Mm -hmm. So it was a lucky coincidence that the remit of the WFF uh, coincided with what the Gruber program really stands for as well. So we decided to have this interdisciplinary conference, sort of an unprecedented one, mm -hmm. to really um, kick off a very new and important and potentially powerful conversation. And what were some of the issues or areas that you examined during the conference? So the notion of gender parity is understood quite differently in different domains. Okay, so explain that. Yeah. So for example, um, and you know, understood differently in different domains in the public sphere, in the political sphere, in universities, and in the domestic sphere. Mm -hmm. And of course, on top of that layering, there's a real difference in the understanding which is culturally based. So across the world, there are very different notions of what gender parity means and what it might look like. Mm -hmm. So we started off the conference really trying to examine what the differences and the similarities are in our notions of parity for all of us situated in very different places mm -hmm. in the university. My particular interest is, of course, looking at women in universities and uh, in academia, uh, in particular, trying to understand what are sort of the systematic difficulties that women might face mm -hmm. and how universities, what they could actually do to ensure gender parity and sort of a more level playing field. Mm -hmm. But we examined many different domains. So we looked at the, the political sphere, mm -hmm. looking at the representation of women. You know, there are some countries in the world, in the US we don't have parity laws, but in many countries of the world, Spain, France, India, Norway, and Turkey, they're experimenting legally with set-asides and quotas. Mm -hmm. And so we looked at that. We looked at the experience of how useful they have been in places and how they worked. We looked at the corporate world, where again, in some Nordic countries, there are um, requirements that there should be 40% of the board, of a corporate board, mm -hmm. should be women. You know, that's been in place for a short time, but we wanted to examine how that's worked mm -hmm. and whether that's an interesting and useful intervention. Right. Curious it's 40%, not 50%. That's right, mm. that's right. <laughs> and, um, and then we looked at the domestic sphere, and, mm -hmm. you know, um, and that's a very fraught sphere because, in mm -hmm. a way, underlying sort of the basis of parity is sort of how it's played out in the domestic sphere mm -hmm. because you know it's the amount of work that household work that uh, and childcare and nurturance that women do women tend to do a larger share of it across the board across mm -hmm. cultures and that impacts their participation in other sure. spheres and so then we looked at the university sphere we looked at academia around the world um, and then we also looked at gender parity as it plays out in the development agenda, mm -hmm. in the agenda of um, the dealing with poverty, dealing with women and extremists. Um, so, you know, we covered a huge sort of range. And I, it was sort of, 
intentional because we wanted to learn from practices. So there are many different meanings that people have adopted for parity. Mm -hmm. So in some places, gender parity is parsed as gender equality. Mm -hmm. And in some places, it is seen as under the rubric of anti-discrimination. Mm -hmm. So our goal here was to sort of try and distill practices and theoretical notions that may translate across boundaries and that we may actually find useful in our respective right. spheres. Okay. And both men and women participated in the conference? Absolutely, yes. but as you can probably predict, it was predominantly women scholars. Mm -hmm. It turns out, um, and I think this is something I really wish will change, uh, Hope I hope changes in my generation, mm -hmm. that uh, many of these issues actually uh, of gender parity are not women's issues, they're human issues. Mm -hmm. And I'm really hoping that more and more men will get uh, seriously drawn into this conversation. That would be very nice. Now, in looking at the world, you touched on it briefly. Um, how are we doing in terms of gender parity out in the world? Um, I would imagine some places are better than others, but is it, is it, is it, more, is it better or is it worse um, percentage, you know, 50-50, you know, countries kind of are, you know, moving in the right direction, or is it less than that? Well, you know, it's very hard uh, because the, there are various axes along which you could measure mm -hmm. um, gender parity, right? Uh, and I think it would be fair to say that uh, it gender parity remains an aspiration mm -hmm. everywhere. Yes. It's not quite the reality. And I think there are a lot of contradictions, right? So you may have countries where you've had a woman head of state, but doesn't, doesn't necessarily imply that the playing field for a normal middle class woman is any more level or an impoverished woman is, any, is in a, any better situation. Mm -hmm. So I think how we measure um, you know, which country is doing um, better on gender parity issues is not so much a sort of a national country wide index, but I think along domains we mm -hmm. can see. And I think it would be fair to say that women have made great strides mm -hmm. in all domains. But sadly, there are still parts of the world where personal safety, violence against women, and sort of inequities in how the law treats uh, a man and a woman with respect to marriage, property, et cetera, are still there. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, of the, the participants in the conference, I'm curious if, in talking about countries that have um, put some kind of laws around gender issues, do people seem to think that that works better, that's more helpful towards um, moving the, um, the issue along, so to speak? So um, it's very interesting that you asked this because this formed one of the sort of heated debates in mm -hmm. the conference. And the, and the debate really rests around the justification. So we were trying to look for, so there's a rights theory justification for why we need to be in a just world and everyone needs to be treated the same mm -hmm. and that we form 50% of the population and so on. But you know, there has been um, a very strong thread in society where women have argued that um, on the outcome of increased participation. I personally feel that you know, there is a justification for aspiring for gender parity regardless of the outcome. Mm -hmm. So I think the question of whether having 40% women in parliament actually translates into being better for women overall is not the question to ask really. It's hard to assess. Mm -hmm. And I think the report on that is mixed. Uh, for instance, in local government, uh, for example, in India, where they required 50% women, mm -hmm. um, some studies show that uh, women, once they are elected into these positions, tend to focus on issues that are tantamount and important to them, like water. So water is an issue in India, and women often are carry water. To for their households. Mm -hmm. So women in these local governments tended to use, start off with water as a priority. However, it's, it's a, as I said, it's mixed because if you look at the Nordic countries, what they found is when you had 40% women in the national legislature, so we're talking about the national level, mm -hmm. not the local level here, for the first six months or so, we heard reports that women focused on what we would see as traditional sort of women's agendas. But then within six months, there was actually no difference. And men and women pushed very, very similar agendas. So I think the question of whether the outcomes are better for women mm 
is a fraught question. And I think what we really need to focus on is that having a more sort of even participation is good for society as mm -hmm. a whole. Right, right. So what were some of the outcomes of the conference? So in one of the interesting, you know, so first of all, having a conference like this with uh, all these different voices mm -hmm. representing so many exemplary scholars and activists was a feat in and of itself. Sure. And the fact that we started a, a very important, what we feel is a very important, interesting conversation that can move forward, that can be helpful for people across domains was one, you know, it was uh, one in which uh, we are hoping to start new collaborations, intellectual collaborations, as well as learn sort of practical things uh, from each other. Mm -hmm. So it was, I think, I see it as a great success because it was the start of a very novel conversation that hasn't happened before. Mm -hmm. And what do you think it would take for gender parity to actually happen and do you think it's achievable? Well, mm. um, well, I hope it's achievable and I hope it's achievable uh, during my lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the notion used to be, for example, if you look at the university's domain, um, that you know it's a question of time. We just don't have, we have this metaphor of a pipeline. We just don't have enough women coming through, particularly in mm -hmm. the STEM fields, the science, technology, um, and mathematics, engineering, mm -hmm. and mathematics fields, that there aren't enough women who are starting off as undergraduates, so we don't have enough in the pool to pick professors from, and so on and so forth. But it turns out that with all the work and the awareness for the past 20 years, you know, the pipeline is now populated. So mm -hmm. it is no longer a question of just time that you know, will catch up in time. I think the things that really need work on for achieving parity are the more in, insidious, complicated, subtle things. Mm -hmm. And they are sort of, sort of the gender stereotyping, more implicit, un yeah, absolutely, things, yeah. unconscious bias. And so and I think what we really need to think hard about for every domain in society is what are the little nudges that are needed to get people to start examining their own stereotypes, men and women, mm -hmm. not just men, men and right. women. And how do you facilitate those nudges? Absolutely. Is, uh, and how do you incentivize thing. them? How do you first make people aware of them? And then how do you incentivize people to actually change? And as you can imagine, right, um, in the domain of um, science in STEM fields, it's particularly difficult because in these disciplines, which uh, we all as practitioners feel that we are objective, we are just, and we are fair, and that we have very clear cr criteria to understand what is good scholarship and what isn't. You know, it, it is not about weighing one argument against the other. So, you know, it's, it's a more, so we feel, and so for us to accept that we have unconscious biases is a huge challenge. Sure. But I think that's really where the future challenge is mm -hmm. for, uh, for us. Of course, there are societies where the challenges are more fundamental uh, with regard to sort of human rights, basic right. human rights. But you know, as I said, the challenges are very different in, very, uh, in, in the various domains. Mm -hmm. But um, I think there's no escape that even once we get the numbers up, that there are other more subtle barriers that we need to tackle. And right. that's the real challenge for the future. Okay, very good. Thank you so much for being here today and um, sharing some of the uh, work that was done at the conference. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. For more information about Professor Natarajan and her work, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.